She slices through the water at more than 30 knots. The newest addition of the biggest fighting machine ever built. 60,000 tons of steel and four and a half acres of flight deck carrying America's war on terror to the mountains of Afghanistan. In this hour, you'll go inside and see things no outsider has ever seen before. The top secret intelligence operation, the high-tech command and control center, a coalition boarding party as it searches for Al-Qaeda leaders on the high seas, and a fighter mission off the deck and deep into Afghanistan. You'll also meet some of the extraordinary young people for whom all of this is just another day at the office, thousands of miles from home. These guys, they're warriors, and that's why we're out here. Today, this is Jack's home, the Blue Diamonds Ready Room. That was a whole lot of nothing. It's kind of a clubhouse, decorated with letters from home, private stashes of gourmet coffee, and a place to play their favorite game, cribbage. Oh, it's fine. I'm in good shape. This morning, Jack has an oh, unexpected wow. piece of mail. His cousin Marv has forwarded a tribute CD of the 911 attack on the World Trade Center. So your cousin sent this to you? Yeah. He's a firefighter. Think of that. Jack's CD is soon the center of attention. As the images begin to play, the mood changes. These crewmen are seeing the reason they are at war. Makes it very easy to go across the beach, that's for sure. And when you send these teenagers up to the flight deck, I mean, they got to do everything to keep that plane in the air, right? Yes, they do. They have a lot of responsibility. A lot of these guys just got out of high school and have never even held a job before. And, and right now, they're the last eyes that look at the airplanes before they go off the deck. It is a complicated, confusing, and potentially deadly ballet directed by this man, Chief Handler Frank Fuentes. Attorney Star, we report. It's his job to tell everyone and everything on this four and a half acre flight deck where to go. Roger. He's clear to spread. Stennis is loaded with the latest high tech gadgetry. But when Fuentes absolutely positively has to know who's where, he looks here. It's called the Ouija board. It gets stressful. I mean, some of these shirts will come in here, some people come in here and just lay it all out at you, you know, shoot you up. I'll sit in that chair and I'll just be taking it off. Down in the rigging room, Jack is putting on his flight gear and getting his sidearm. He has two clips of ammunition in case the plane goes down over Afghanistan. His mission today, close air support for troops on the ground. For Jack, it's a job that brings home exactly why he and the rest of the carrier crew are out here. During Operation Anaconda, we were going over the beach and dropping every single mission, every single day for two weeks. These guys can, they can see Taliban Al-Qaeda half a mile away and they're giving us coordinates, hey, you know, we need you to take care of these guys. They've been shooting at us all day. And you can hear, you can hear fear in these kids' voice. And it's actually, it's, that, that puts a whole nother meaning on, on top of the, the World Trade Center because you can hear other Americans down there with just death in their voice. It, it's horrifying. Now suited up, Jack heads for the flight deck. But before climbing into the cockpit, he has one final piece of business, putting his firefighter cousin Marv's name on a bomb. Jack's big hope today, that he gets to drop it. It is a delicate maneuver. So is resupplying Stennis, which has made only one port call in the last three and a half months. With 5,200 people on board, they consume a lot of almost everything on the Stennis. So resupply is a critical factor, and it's a tricky business. That ship is pulled alongside, and it's running at 13 knots with the Stennis as they send over all manner of supplies. Captain's on the bridge. The captain of the carrier, James McDonnell, is overseeing this replenishment. Come left, 328. Come left, Steer Force, 328. It takes a delicate touch. Falling back just a little bit. To make sure the giant carrier gets no closer than 150 feet. On board, USNS Concord. Good morning. Stand by for my shot lines. Forward and aft. Once the lines are fired across, cables are attached so supplies can be ferried to Stennis. And it is massive. 11 decks from top to bottom. The bridge overlooks the flight deck. Under that, the main hangar deck, where the planes are serviced. Below the water line, most of the living quarters. At the bottom, the engine room and the carrier's nuclear reactors. The last commanding officer of this ship is probably not even born yet. 
This uh, ship's uh, supposed to last at least 50 years, and I don't think it'll have any trouble be making that. For such an enormous ship, Stennis can move, but the top speed is classified. Yeah. If we wanted to push it real hard, how fast could we go? Oh, this uh, nearly 100,000 ton ship has no problem going 30 plus knots. How much is plus? Uh, it, it can be a bigger or a little or plus, depending upon uh, what kind of screw set you'd have on or things like that, but uh, it's plus. Captain McDonnell and his crew use GPS satellites to help them navigate. The Freebolt tug of home is taking its toll as well. In the sick bay, doctors are seeing a widespread case of the cruise blues. Does have a case of the blues? It may not be the same as home, but for now, it is home. And for now, personal lives must be put aside to concentrate on the business of war. How much of the personal demeanor on the ship changed and in what way after 911? After that attack, uh, there was no doubt in their mind that what they were doing was in direct defense of the country and direct defense of the way that Americans had chosen to live. Today, there is one more reminder of the mission a flag which is raised on special occasions. It was found in the rubble of the World Trade Center. When we come back, what is it like to spend three hours strapped in a fighter jet on a mission? The pilots of a Tomcat squadron let me find out high over Afghanistan. Keeping these planes repaired and ready to go, getting them launched on their combat missions, that's the primary assignment of a carrier and members of a Tomcat squadron, VF-211. The checkmates invited me to go along with them to what they call the beach, a mission over Afghanistan. Before we can get airborne, there is a detailed checklist, even for a backseat observer like me. At 11 a.m., Commander Owen P. Honors, OP for short, takes me to an intelligence briefing. Our mission, provide close air support for the ground forces in Afghanistan. Taking a look at the, uh, the Paktia province, our main area of concern for today's missions, we still assess there to be about 1,000 Taliban al-Qaeda in that area. And right now, mainly, they're trying to blend in with the local population in an effort to avoid uh, coalition uh, efforts to find them. The Navy also needs surveillance photos of the former Taliban and al-Qaeda strongholds. Man pads and AAA are still the number one threat. There has not been much ground fire at the Tomcats, and we will stay high out of range, much to my relief. So over the next several days, be on the watch for an increase in both small arms and AAA fire. Okay, where is Mr. Brokaw going to get dressed? After the briefing, we suit up. First comes the helmet. Anchormen have huge heads, Mr. You know. Dan. Next, the G-suit, a pressure suit for the lower body that keeps blood going back to the brain, preventing pilots from blacking out during sharp, fast turns. Does it zip down? And finally, the torso harness, which will connect me to a parachute inside the jet. Does it tell me if it's pinching anywhere? No, that's good. Since we're flying over open ocean and hostile territory, I'm briefed on radio frequencies and ejection procedures. There are emergency rations, sharp repellent, even a fishing hook, just in case. I think we got a match. Great. We will fly the F-14 Tomcat, a two-person, $40 million fighter bomber that can cruise at more than twice the speed of sound. It has a rapid-fire cannon and carries missiles and bombs. As we load on to the F-14 and go through our pre-flight checks, I am focused on two goals not screwing up, and not throwing up. Copy it. Doing a control sweep. There they go. Yeah, they're under control. They're about 10 seconds away now. Watch out! And when that catapult grabs the jet, OP is in charge, and I'm on the ride of a lifetime. Afterburners are firing, bringing us to more than 400 miles an hour in just seconds. On board Stennis, the flight is immediately tracked. We are designated Clash 71. Clash 71, you have good flight, so you can get back. Conditions are excellent. Clear skies and not much wind. It's a long haul from the carrier. Our mission will take us 1,500 miles, crossing over Pakistan into Afghanistan and up to our objective, Kandahar. We have to line up for a mid-air refueling on the way. 
and from this vantage point, I have new appreciation of a hostile terrain. Have you ever been over territory that is more foreboding and forbidding than that red desert that runs right up to the edge? Not at all. Not at all. I, I guess that's what the moon would look like if we went to the moon. Somewhere down there is the 1,500-mile-long border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And no one knows better than you how many places there are to hide. They can stick you in a hundred thousand crevices. That's why I think it's just so hard to accurately target some of these places. I mean, one cave looks the same as another. It looks the same as another. I don't know how anyone ever polices that border. I mean, oh. where does Pakistan end and <laughs> Afghanistan begins? There's, there's no, no clear place. We fly up to our reconnaissance point, the airfield at Kandahar, where we shoot this digital image and feed it back to the intelligence specialist on board Stennis. Again, the images coming through. You can see the buildings, you see heat sources. This was a short, routine mission, three hours in all, no targets to hit, but every flight is demanding. Hot, tense, and total concentration in a high-tech cockpit over a pair of high-powered rockets. It's tough on your body. That's why we only do it for a certain amount of days in a row. Then we'll take a day off. Let's go. And at the end of every mission comes the most harrowing challenge of all. It all seems fine until you look out and say, that's pretty small. <laughs> We're going to find that <laughs> and land on it. Before we touch down, a flyby, 80 feet off the deck, and a vertical climb to peel off for our approach. Tomcat's five miles out. The landing, the trap, is much more jarring than the takeoff. Yeah. The landing gets your attention. You know, it's, uh, he asked me twice whether I was locked into the <laughs> It was a ride I'll never forget. People make Stennis what it is in tough conditions, remarkable social and racial harmony, a team of volunteer warriors fighting America's war on terror. There isn't a man or a woman on the ship that didn't come from someplace. There's a story behind every one of them, whether they're from a big city or from a farm in Iowa or from a vineyard in California. The thing that makes this place go are those young men and women, those sailors and Marines from all over the country and their enthusiasm and their, their dedication. After its tour in these waters, USS John C. Stennis returns to his home port in California. Some of the people that we've met tonight will be rotated off the ship. Others will get new assignments on board. But all of them, whatever their job, will be battle-tested. Veterans of a ship at war. I'm Tom Brokaw for Discovery Channel. Thank you for joining us. You know, one of the great things about being a journalist is uh, living this vicarious life and to go out and spend 48 hours on a nuclear-powered carrier, have access to all 11 levels, and most of all, to see these remarkable men and women young. who make it go. And there are, many of them are so young. And they're the ones who get the planes ready and do the maintenance, and they're working on all the electronic boards, and they're working in the intel unit. and. It's tough, it's noisy, it's crowded, it's going on 24-7. They've been at sea since November 15th at that point. Not a whimper from any of them, a couple of gripes about having to work a little overtime. And then the best and brightest up on the bridge who come out of the Naval Academy. It's a city, isn't it? In that oh, and it's 5,200 people on board a ship. The carrier deck is four and a half football fields in effect. But I got to launch off the deck and uh, like? go on a mission up over Afghanistan in the backseat of an F-14. And uh, refuel, come back and land. Yeah, you got a chutzpah. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and I had great pilot. OP honors was the best. And we had a guy by the name of Smiling Jack Belsitas and an F-18 F Hornet who was terrific as well. And when you land, it's, uh, it's like a controlled crash landing is what it's like.